my name is Jeremy Tessier. I'm based in Toronto. Um, and my role as a knowledge transfer specialist sounds really fancy, but basically what I do is I come to different events, let people know about the, fun the funding opportunities at the CMHC. A little bit closer? Okay, thank you. Um, so that's my role is to keep everybody updated when we have new programs, make sure that our partners or potential applicants are aware of the program parameters. But, so that's one part of my role. The other part of my role is to hear from you, right? We wanna know um, where the roadblocks are. We wanna know what projects you're working on because when I talk to somebody else, maybe I can make a connection, maybe I can point you towards some resources. Um, so a big part of the, the role is also, you know, receiving knowledge from the community. So um, I hope that we'll have opportunities to do that. So if you, please come talk to me after the session if you have questions or you wanna tell me about your, your projects you're working on, I'm happy to, to listen. Uh, and advise for whatever situation may arise. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my role at the CMHC, and I appreciate that this is a talk about funding. It can get a bit dry when we're talking about program parameters. So, and I can appreciate that you just had lunch. Um, so, if anything you take away from this is that well, how, you have people at the CMHC you can talk to, right? So maybe this is more of an overview to kind of put some ideas in your head and we can revisit um, and, and look at how it might apply to your situation. So what I have proposed for you today is to go through some updates that were announced in the last fall economic statement and more recently in the budget 2024, and then also kind of put in context the role of the CMHC, what kind of supports we can offer. Um, obviously financial, financial supports, but also there's other supports. Um, and then we're gonna look at some programs. So we're gonna look at the newly launched Cooperative Housing Development Program. We're gonna look at the uh, Affordable Housing Fund, which is kind of our flagship program for the nonprofit sector. And we'll also look at MLI Select, which is a mortgage loan insurance product, but also um, is very widely used and has been used by organizations to secure uh, units for the social good and for nonprofits. And then also finish off with some research and innovation. Uh, we have some research funding available and um, cap that off with some um, examples of cool innovation projects that we funded in the past. And hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A. So I have a lot of slides to get through. Um, please bear with me. It's not gonna be as inspiring and motivational as the other talks, but uh, hopefully you'll get something out of it. So um, to kick us off, looking at budget 2024, Canada's new housing plan. This is not a comprehensive list of all the measures that were in that plan, just some highlights that I thought would be of interest to the folks here uh, this weekend. So the first one being our co-op housing program that was launched back in June. We had our first round. Uh, it's 1.5 billion committed to developing uh, co-ops around Canada. We also have the Public Lands for Homes initiative that is an expansion of our uh, federal lands initiative, which is disposing of underused federal lands and um, they've also added a new mapping feature that you can go and consult online. There's five properties on there right now. You can leave comments that will be reviewed by the project team, so giving input through the, throughout the process of making these lands available. Um, and they, they have five properties for now, but the intention obviously is to increase that and um, make those lands available for affordable housing on long-term leases. We have the Affordable Housing Fund, which I mentioned is our flagship fund for the nonprofit sector, and it was topped up to now 15 billion. There was an extra 1 billion in the fall economic statement of last year, and then another 1 billion in the budget 2024 um, for a total of 15. And they also are including a rapid housing uh, stream in the affordable housing fund. We used to have a thing called the Rapid Housing Initiative, which was building shelters, building supportive housing quickly across municipalities uh, across Canada. Now that program, this is not a renewal of that program, but it's kind of a, a new substream of the affordable housing fund that is aimed at supporting um, those in the greatest need. So, you know, shelters and supportive housing, essentially. Um, housing design catalog, I also thought might be of interest to you. There was just an announcement the other day that they're expecting kind of a December 2024 soft launch of uh, some of these um, blueprints that are, this catalog basically is hiring firms to develop blueprints that would be regionally specific. So there's a firm in BC that's doing the BC region. We have a Prairies region, uh, Quebec, Ontario, and Atlantic. 
And these are um, standardized housing designs that you can use. Hopefully they'll be pre-approved by the municipalities um, and costed so you kind of have a sense of what you can build, kind of have a little more predictability uh, when you're thinking about you know, what, what can happen on the lands that you're, that you're, that you're targeting. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight, though I don't have any news about it, unfortunately, is we do have uh, plans for a Canada Rental Protection Fund. So if any of you were here yesterday and heard about the BC uh, Rental Protection Fund, um, this is kind of presumably going to be modeled after that and um, operate kind of similarly to ensure that we can have uh, the preservation, acquiring and preserving uh, housing units across the country. So the role the CMHC has evolved over the years. Um, we used to do, yeah, blueprints and built a lot of kind of the suburban houses that you might see, uh, might have been based on a CMHC blueprint back in the 60s and 70s. Um, we very focused on mortgage loan insurance, but since 2018, the federal government has kind of given us this mandate of delivering on the national housing strategy. And so this is kind of, um, we're, in, we're now in year six of the national housing strategy, and there's a lot of things happening within the national housing strategy, but I want to highlight for you that um, part of that work is, of course, to build new affordable housing, to repair and renew existing affordable housing, support uh, social housing providers, and then do research and innovation to, again, support, like find ways of innovating and um, making sure that uh, we can build the supply we need given all the constraints and issues in the housing system today. Um, so thinking about CMHC supports now, you're probably a lot of you are aware of the funding, maybe you're here to hear about the, the funding, but I also just wanted to flag that we have other departments at the CMHC that do information gathering. So we have economists that do market insights, we have researchers that do um, projects, we have partnerships externally that also feed into those projects, and so we have a housing knowledge center that you can tap into um, and you know explore all kinds of topics um, housing related that might affect you know the demographics you're trying to house or the specific project you have in mind so just keep in mind that there are resources beyond the monetary resources at the CMHC we also have our housing market information portal which I will uh, touch on when we talk about the co-op program of course we have funding so we do pre-construction funding uh, construction and repair research and innovation and then the last thing um, I also want to mention is you know, trying to foster connections, right? So kind of I said off the top, my role as a knowledge transfer specialist is uh, about trying to foster those connections in the sector. And we also have kind of an online version of uh, a forum called the Expert Community on Housing where we host events on different subjects of interest in the housing sector and hoping to kind of have a critical mass of housing practitioners on there so we can have peer-to-peer -peer learning. So it's not just CMHC providing information out, but really um, having, activating the sector and having uh, those conversations in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer way. So what I want to talk to you today about is really um, the Affordable Housing Fund. We're going to talk about the Co-op Housing Development Program. Uh, we're not going to talk about the Canada Greener Affordable Housing Program. That's my bad. I shouldn't have added that there. And then we'll talk about MLI Select. And so something to keep in mind when we go through these programs is on one side we have direct lending, which is you apply to the CMHC, we analyze the file, we prioritize certain files. Um, it's a competitive process. Um, we also have mortgage loan insurance, which is you're not coming to the CMHC directly, you're going to a lender and you're asking for a loan from a financial institution and then that loan would be potentially insured by the CMHC and there's benefits to doing that. Um, so the way I like to talk about it is social outcomes, right? We have a desire for more affordability. We have a desire for energy efficiency, for building communities that are resilient over time. So thinking about aging in place for accessibility, for example, proximity to amenities. So, you know, let's not build green filled sites on the edge of town, but let's like redevelop our communities and make sure that they're vibrant. Um, and then also thinking about partnerships so how can we activate the sector? How can we get more folks involved? How can we build the capacity uh, to take on projects and to be stewards of the land and stewards of their communities? Um, so those are kind of the outcomes that we're looking for. And then the way CMHC tries to incentivize those outcomes is with 
uh, monetary incentives. So we offer lower interest rates than you might find on the market, uh, lower equity requirements to getting those loans, uh, longer amortization periods, lower debt coverage ratios, and uh, longer loan terms, um, which kind of sounds kind of dry, but all that to say, um, we're trying to make it easy for our partners in the sector to provide those social outcomes. Um, so this is just kind of a way of looking at the housing continuum. I'm sure most of you have seen this diagram of the housing continuum. Um, and this is where our programs kind of lie within that continuum. So when you see this diagram, you might think, you know, we have equal amounts of all of these housing types, but it's kind of deceiving because 95% of the housing is market housing. Uh, so when you look at this diagram, you might think, you know, we have kind of a mix, right? But really, we need to be focusing on de delivering these other types of housing. So for when the market housing doesn't work, um, we have alternatives. Or, you know, not everyone wants to live in market housing. So let's, let's just create uh, diversity in the housing continuum for our communities. Um, also, as I go through this, we're going to talk about affordability. This is a question that gets asked a lot. What's the definition of affordability? Of course, it varies uh, across the country by province in the communities. Um, and when we're talking about CMHC programs, it's really hard to talk about affordability on a personal level, right? Because when you're designing a program, you don't know who the future tenant is gonna be. So we tend to use certain benchmarks to say, this is what we assume affordability will be uh, in any particular region. So for our affordable housing fund, we use median market rent. So we'll look at, we do a, we do a survey every year of the housing uh, market and we determine what the median rent is and we say for it to be affordable under this program it has to be 80 percent of that median market rent for the co-op housing development program new program very similar uh, to the affordable housing fund but the metric is different and you'll see a benchmark of 110 percent of post 2000 median market rent um, and i'll get into kind of some of the reasoning behind that later but then we also have the MLI Select, which is again a different program, and that's based on median household of renter income. Um, so all of these are, end up being a different number on your balance sheet uh, or in your pro forma. And uh, just important, that when we say affordable housing, it, it, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a standard definition. So the first program I wanna tell you about is the Co-op Housing Development Program. This was just launched June 15th was the application window that was opened. It also closed on September 15th, but there will be more coming, which is why I'm here telling you about it. Um, the co-op housing development program is an opportunity to, to create new rental co-ops across Canada. And uh, it's intended to build strong communities that meet the needs of today and anticipate the needs of tomorrow. So the objectives of the program are to increase the supply of co-op housing, obviously, and also promote long-term sustainability through larger projects. Um, and we'll see there's certain criteria around the number of units that we're asking for these projects to, uh, to come forward with. And the reason behind that is for the sake of sustainability. Um, and it was noted that larger projects tend to be, you know, more successful um, and can draw on a larger talent pool for the management of those organizations. So really about strengthening the sector, the expertise and the capacity of the co-op housing uh, sector. Who's eligible for the funding? Um, so you will see land trusts up there. So really it's a program designed for the nonprofit housing cooperatives and indigenous housing cooperatives. Uh, indigenous governing organizations uh, are also eligible and are land trusts. Um, land trusts on their own are not eligible, but a land trust that would be creating a co-op on the land trust would be uh, eligible in that sense. So project types, um, they have to be nonprofit housing cooperative. They have to be creating net new units. Uh, so it's not, it can't be used for purchasing existing housing and turning it into a co-op. It would have to be new construction. It would have to be turnkey projects. So for example, um, someone who developed a condo and then they can't sell any units, you could maybe buy that condo out and turn into a co-op. Um, densification, so for existing co-ops to say, well, we have some land next to the existing co-op, let's build another you know, building, that would be 
a way of using this fund as well, and conversion of non-residential buildings. So, you know, an old hotel, um, maybe some of these uh, federal lands that are gonna become available might be opportunities for conversions and to turn them into co-ops. Um, yeah, so we go through the, the mandatory minimum eligibility requirements for the program. So we're looking at project size as a requirement, and then affordability, energy efficiency, and accessibility. These are gonna come up in all of our programs. Um, those are kind of the three pillars of the social outcomes we wanna see. But for this program, we do have a specific criteria around project size. So most of our programs are a five unit minimum. But for the co-op program, for large urban centers, we're asking for a 75 unit minimum um, if it's a municipality of a population over 100,000. Um, not to say you can't apply, you can apply, but you won't score as high as an organization that comes in with the project uh, meeting that threshold. So for small and medium urban centers, between 100,000 people and 99,000 people, you can do a 30 unit project. And then for rural remote, northern and indigenous communities, you can do a five unit minimum size uh, co-op. Obviously more is better uh, when we're building co-ops, there's economies of scale in terms of governance and management, all those things to make it that um, we wanna see bigger projects obviously, but there's all kinds of constraints across the country and due to the nature of a national program in a largely geographically different country, um, we wanna have those options there. Um, so thinking about affordability, so um, I referenced this earlier, we have a tool called the Housing Market Information Portal, and it's based on data that the CMHC collects every year. So you can go onto this website, you can find out what the, the construction starts are, what the completions are, what the vacancy rates are in different uh, areas, and look at what the median market rent is. You can use it to understand a lot of things about the housing situation in your community. Um, you can also use it to figure out what that benchmark cost per unit that you can propose is for this fund, which in this case is 110% of the median market rent. Um, and the reason they chose this benchmark of 110% of median market rent might seem like it's not affordable. Um, and it's really because that's kind of what they, the program designers analyzed and figured out that this way we can make sure that these co-ops are self-sustaining over the long term. Um, and won't require, you know, in 10, 20, 25 years, more investments um, to really be self-sustaining. So that was the reasoning behind that choice. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, we're now transitioning to the 2020 building code. Some of you might be familiar with our programs where we referenced the 2015 building code. Uh, we're gonna be transitioning towards 2020, but for this program, it already is the 2020, uh, and we're looking for tier two or tier three uh, energy efficiency, and that equates to about a 25% above code for the 2015 uh, building code that we're currently using. And then just that second point is kind of badly wordy, but it just means that uh, going forward, if the codes were to change, we would benchmark them to any new code changes. Um, accessibility, there are two options for accessibility. So we do wanna make the units accessible, um, either 20% of the units accessible, or you can do uh, universal design, which is something that is becoming more popular, thinking about planning for aging in place, right? So maybe you wanna not necessarily make it fully accessible, but make it adaptable for different tenants so that they can age in their units or age in the building and just have uh, a responsiveness to the variety of needs of your tenants. Let's look at the funding, the fun part. Um, so funding for this program, is a combination of repayable loans and forgivable loans. So the repayable loan will be uh, a 10 year term or potentially, and then renewable for another 10 year term. Um, so it's 10 year fixed rate that would be fixed at the time of when you take your first draw uh, to start construction. And then the forgivable loan can be up to a third of uh, the project costs. I say up to a third because that's really the maximum allowable what they typically do is they'll say, what do we need to provide to you in terms of a forgivable loan so that you are viable, right? We wanna spread this money out as far as possible so we can touch as many communities as possible. So we wanna make sure these projects uh, are viable and to do that, we need to provide forgivable loans, but we wanna max out the impact of this fund. Um, eligible costs, and this is really great. Um, 
because it covers soft costs and hard costs. A lot of our programs don't cover soft costs and hard costs. They're really about construction. They're really about hard costs. But this program can cover the cost of acquisition of land, pre-development costs, as well as everything that's a hard cost. So um, it's really meant to enable rapid uptake and uh, project viability. Um, application intake, so as I mentioned earlier, we had our first application intake window in the summer of 2024. Uh, the portal is now closed. It closed on September 15th, but we do expect another window in early 2025. So if any of you are interested in new construction or you have some sites that you think might be uh, potentially viable, uh, I would consider looking into this now and, and starting to think about maybe if you're in a situation where you can uh, potentially make an application for the next round. So just a summary here, it's a $1.5 billion fund in forgivable and repayable loans to create thousands of new co-ops. Um, it's really intended to develop inclusive and strong communities and develop units that are affordable, sustainable, energy efficient, and equitable across Canada. Next up, we're talking about the Affordable Housing Fund. So this is our flagship fund for the nonprofit sector. Um, it used to be called the Co-Investment Fund up until about a year ago, where we changed it to Affordable Housing Fund. Um, and the co-investment fund kind of alluded to the fact that we wanted co-investors, so we wanted another level of government to participate, whether that's provincial or municipal, some other stakeholder that could provide supports, whether that's capital supports or operational supports. Um, so this fund is intended to provide low-cost repayable loans with some loan forgiveness uh, and potentially contributions to build new affordable housing and repair existing affordable housing. So there's two streams. We have the new construction stream, which is for minimum five units, um, minimum, minimum $1 million project cost, and that's really for designing uh, high-performing affordable housing that is near amenities and that prioritizes um, priority populations. So we have definitions of who's a priority population, but basically it's those that are, have been historically denied uh, housing or are in the greatest housing need. Um, repair and renewal, we have a fund that is really intended to support affordable housing providers. You know, if you do a building condition assessment and you realize you need a lot of work to be done, you can potentially apply to this fund um, and not only, you know, bring your building back to where it was in terms of repairs, but do better in terms of energy efficiency, accessibility, and hopefully that could, like, op lower your operating costs down the road and increase the comfort for your tenants. Um, and that has a minimum investment of 250000 So as I mentioned, it used to be called the Co-Investment Fund. It's now called the Affordable Housing Fund, but the requirement for partnerships remains. So we really want to make these funds go as far as possible, and we ask that additional sources of funding be targeted. So you would have to come in with another level of support from another level of government, whether that's, you know, as I mentioned, operational or uh, capital funding. It can be in the form of investments of resources, it can be sweat equity, it can be in-kind contributions. Uh, at the very minimum, it has to be a letter of endorsement from the municipality. Um, but ideally, you know, anything like waiving development charges, tax holidays, um, expediting permitting, working with you on these projects, land leases, municipalities have tons of tools that they can use to support the development of affordable housing. Um, and we, we ask that, you know, those be sought out and uh, used to help bring these affordable housing projects forward and sustain them. Um, so this is kind of the, the, again, the three pillars, affordability, energy efficiency, and accessibility that most of our programs require. This program requires that 30% of units be at 80% of the median market rent as a minimum to apply. And then we also ask for energy efficiency improvements and accessibility improvements. Um, for new construction, you have to have all three of these. But a few weeks ago in September, um, they announced that there would be a change for the repair fund, excuse me, <coughs> a change to the repair fund where you no longer had to abide by all three. You still have to abide by the affordability criteria, but we recognize that not every building can become accessible and not every building can make big gains in energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emission reductions. So those are no longer a requirement, but they will be prioritized. Um, so when you're putting in an application, 
we ask that you try your best to do to meet these uh, requirements um, in order to be prioritized in this process that can be competitive. Um, and just to flag that um, we will be updating the, the codes for energy efficiency to the 2020 codes uh, some point in the near future to harmonize with our other programs. Um, so the financial incentives we offer for this program, so we offer low interest loans for new construction and we offer low interest loans and potentially contributions for the repair and renewal of the funding. Um, there are certain carve outs for that. So the contribution option is for repairs. Like if you have most of your funding in place to do repairs and you just need a little top up to get you across the finish line, you can apply for a contribution. If you're doing more large scale repairs and you need a lot of funding, you're better off with a low interest loan. Um, for new construction, it's always gonna be a low interest loan with some loan forgiveness unless you're a black-led organization, in which case we do have some contribution funding for black-led organizations. But again, it's not, uh, it's, it's kind of a top-up, right? So if you have most of your funding in place, you can apply to this fund and get you across the finish line. Um, loan to cost could be up to 95%. So, you know, that would mean that you're bringing 5% of equity and then relying on 95% uh, debt. Of course, the less, you know, that's not ideal. Uh, ideally, you'd bring more equity in and you'll score higher in your application if you do have more equity that you can secure from another level of government um, to make these projects more viable. And there's also a non-residential component to that. So you could propose a project where you have like ground floor community spaces or something like that, or ground floor commercial spaces um, and have that in a mixed use development that's, that's uh, doable as well. You can amortize it over 50 years for new construction or 40 years for repairs, which allows the costs to be less of a burden as they're spread out over a longer period of time. And then debt coverage ratios are as low as one, meaning the income you're receiving is basically matching the, inc uh, the costs to service the debt um, at one for the residential component. Um, so as I mentioned, it's somewhat of a competitive process. We do prioritize projects that come in. They don't always all get funded whenever you submit. Um, we really want to prioritize projects that are near ready. So shovel ready within six months will be prioritized. The ones that achieve the highest in terms of the social outcomes we want to see um, serve the priority groups that I mentioned earlier. We have uh, you know, a list of just priority populations that we want to see housed and that have the most uh, co-investment from other partners. This is an example uh, here in BC in Victoria of a co-op that was 75 units of townhouses and they were in need of urgent repairs. Um, and so CMHC was able to put together a package where they supported the repairs up to 93% of the costs for a 15.5 million repayable loan. Um, and they waived the accessibility requirements due to the urgent repairs and the fact that these townhouses were not gonna be able to meet that uh, accessibility requirement. This is an example um, from where I'm from in Ottawa, um, where they developed a really cool veterans house in Ottawa. So this was 40 units of rental housing that's deeply affordable. Um, they have caseworkers come in, they have spaces for veterans to heal and to deal with uh, disabilities and mental health challenges, working with different community organizations to pr provide supports. Uh, the land was donated by the federal government, so that's kind of the partnership piece. And it's also a passive house, so it does really well in terms of energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emission reductions. And there's projects like this uh, all across Canada, but I'd just like to highlight this one in particular. Um, how are we doing for time? Lots of time, okay, great. Uh, MLI Select, so this is a program that is mortgage loan insurance. We're no longer looking at directly applying to the CMHC. This is you're gonna go to a financial institution and you're gonna ask them for a loan and then you're gonna say, by the way, I wanna get mortgage loan insurance on that loan to unlock um, a better deal in your capital stack. Um, so this is, we have standard mortgage loan insurance. Maybe some of you have mortgage loan insurance on your, on your homes, um, but we have a commercial version of that. So it's a five plus unit rental housing uh, mortgage loan insurance product. And um, we have our standard MLI. This is MLI Select, which is kind of um, asking for social outcomes to be provided, but it's more a la carte. It's more choose your own adventure in terms of those social outcomes that you're being asked to provide. And this was kind of designed in partnership with the housing sector. 
recognizing that not every project can be accessible or very energy efficient or deeply affordable based on you know, the past history of the building uh, and the markets that it's in. So the idea here is that you commit to social outcomes and in exchange you get reduced uh, insurance premiums so the premium amount you pay on that mortgage, on the insurance is lower, uh, higher loan to values, so coming in with less equity, um, lower debt coverage ratios, longer amortization periods, and recourse and replacement reserve flexibilities. Um, some other advantages as well. So what that looks like, it's like a point-based system. So basically, you would say, I'm aiming to provide this level of social outcomes, that'll get you some points. And then you use those points to get better financing. So level one for new construction, if 10% of the units are affordable, that gets you 50 points, that gets you into the program. Um, for existing properties though, you need to have 40% of the units affordable to get those 50 points. And the idea there is that we wanna preserve that affordability. Um, the best you can do is 100 points. So if you wanna provide 80% of your units affordable, you can get 100 points, and then you'll max out your score. Um, you could also do something like 70 points, um, having 60% of those units affordable, but doing over a 20-year period, that'll get you an additional 30 points, and then uh, you get the, the maximum benefit of this program through affordability. And affordability is just one piece, so you could do some affordability um, mixed with climate criteria, so building to a higher standard, um, and that can get you additional points that you can use towards getting those financial financing terms. Um, so I don't have to go into the details of this, you can find this on our website, but basically you could combine those two things and get more points. You can also combine them with accessibility criteria to get additional points. Um, so this is really, as I mentioned, kind of a la carte, choose whatever works best. You can do different modeling scenarios to see um, what meets your target goals and where do you, what areas you want to prioritize. Um, and again, it's going to be site specific. So I don't know if you can all see this because it's kind of small print, but if you direct your eyes to the second half, the bottom half of the screen, you'll see where it kind of explains the benefits. So with a 50 points, you can get a loan to cost for a new construction of up to 95%, uh, a DCR of 1.1, and you can amortize that over 40 years. Uh, a rental achievement is waived and it is recourse. But if you go to 100 points, um, it becomes limited recourse, which means that in the event of a default, the assets that could be reclaimed would be limited to those uh, tied to the project. Um, this might be more interesting to look at in terms of securing existing units for affordable. Um, similar table on the bottom there, but you'll notice the loan to value is a bit lower for the 50 points, but it does go up to 95% for the 100 points. Um, it can always be the case that you're gonna get a 95% loan to value because ultimately, if you're trying to provide affordable affordability in those units, the income you're gonna receive may not be high enough to justify a 95% loan. You might need more equity up front for it to uh, work out, but it is there as an option for you. And um, you'll notice that the rental achievement um, may apply, but, um, or sorry, yeah, it, it would likely apply in most cases, meaning that you'd wanna make sure that you're housing tenants um, before all the funds are dispersed, and it, it is lim limited recourse. One thing that the, was, was flagged to us that the nonprofit sector likes about this program is that because you have volunteer members on your board um, that don't wanna take on liability, there is an option to um, not seek to hold uh, the shareholders liable or the board members liable and um, just provides that peace of mind when people are giving all their time to these organizations uh, to, to make sure they're not also you know, financially burdened with um, having to uh, bear the cost of um, being involved in, in uh, proposing these projects. Last thing I wanna to touch on is the research opportunities we have currently at the CMHC and some kind of fun things I wanted to highlight for you in terms of the innovations that we've been working on. Let's see how we're doing for time, lots of time, okay. Um, so we do have the Solutions Lab back this year. Um, I know some people were talking about the Solutions Lab yesterday, I heard it being thrown around a bit. We have some groups 
from the CLT movement that have successfully applied. I think Upper Hammonds Plain has applied uh, and was successful in developing a, a solutions lab. And this is basically an opportunity to create, create a project team, uh, bring together diverse stakeholders, and work with an expert, uh, innovative consultants that would design and implement a solutions lab to look at a, a housing issue and kind of provide uh, problem solving methodologies and best practices and tools and then develop potential solutions that you can prototype uh, and test and uh, create a roadmap of how that can be replicated elsewhere. So it's an opportunity for community-based knowledge creation that I think um, is very relevant for the, the folks in the room today who you know, might be facing challenges that um, they would like to have some funding to, uh, be, uh, to assist them in solving. So um, the, it, the fund is currently open. If you're interested, I'd be happy to direct you towards some resources. We also have the demonstration initiative, which I believe was also mentioned um, yesterday by Nat. So the de demonstration initiative is new, 2024. The last one was in 2021, and the last one was focused on community land trusts. So uh, CNCLT, lots of other land trusts that are here today did receive some financing to demonstrate the uh, viability of their land trusts projects and bring them forward and add momentum to this process. So the demonstration initiative, unlike the Solutions Lab, which is more research-based, this is kind of, well, it's demonstration-based. So we're, you know, kind of using a real-life environment to demonstrate a solution um, to highlight the impacts and put them in a real-world setting and, um, you know, document that process, look at the benefits, try to identify ways to adapt it, to implement it in other scenarios, and to make it useful across the sector. Um, so these are just some examples of uh, land trusts that were successful in the 2021 demonstration initiative. The Ottawa Community Land Trust, um, the Downtown East Side Community Land Trust, the Calgary Urban Indigenous Community Land Trust Development Project, among several others, um, were able to uh, take advantage of this funding. Um, so they're both currently open. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but there's a theme similar to both of these this year. And the theme is um, how can we create innovations or create opportunities to support the nonprofit housing sector? So it's fairly broad, but it has to be modeled around trying to find solutions to break down barriers, uh, overcome obstacles that are, uh, have been identified in the nonprofit housing sector, and hopefully scale them up and replicate them across the country. Um, last thing I want to tell you about is the housing supply challenge. So the housing supply challenge is now closed. We had five rounds, and this was all about kind of spurring on innovations that could help the, the sector, right? So we had the first round was around gathering data, like trying to understand how to make good decisions and uh, what tools are available. How can we help innovate tools that will help you make good decisions about um, where to take your capacity to develop projects? We had the second round around getting started. So, you know, financing other tools you'll need to actually put the wheels in motion. Uh, the third round was around northern access. So looking at how we can provide better uh, outcomes for the construction in the north or community building in the north. The last one was building for the future, which was really about kind of technical innovations. So, um, you know, cross laminated timber, the other CLT. Um, mass timber, you know, modular housing, those kinds of things. And then the last round was the leveling up, which was trying to take successful projects and scale them up, make them uh, more robust. So I just want to give you some examples of some stuff that was funded through here, but this is all available on our website, and you can hopefully draw inspiration or maybe get in contact with these people if you think there's a benefit um, to what you're trying to achieve. Um, so round one, data-driven, we have a, a group called Map Your Property, Inc. They're a consortium of affordable housing data called COAT. I don't know if they still go by that same name, um, but basically what they're doing is they're aggregating all kinds of data into a platform that you can use to then understand whether you can go forward with the project. Um, so, you know, as you'll find when you're looking at different parcels of land, sometimes the projects won't pencil out and you have to move on. 
And so this is a way of kind of understanding, quickly assessing whether that project can be viable and reduce those pre-development costs and save you time through that process. It's really about streamlining the decision-making process uh, that you would need to undertake when you're doing uh, affordable development and construction. It also helps with modeling. You can kind of help build your case if you have to present to the municipality. You can also use this to put together a great PowerPoint and tell the municipality, like, look what we're trying to do. Here's how it's viable. Give us some funding to uh, look at it further, you know? So that's one example. The other one is uh, based on, uh, based here in, in British Columbia, UBC, the Housing Assessment Resource Tool. So this was a project that was developed to address um, like data gaps and aggregate them into one tool that can be used. And it was uh, very impactful for municipalities to use this um, when we were developing our Housing Accelerator Fund, which was a fund that gave money to municipalities to increase uh, gentle density and, uh, and, and build more units in their communities. So um, continues to grow, and I think some of the people who developed it are here today. You can certainly talk to them. Yeah, go talk to Sarah about it. I um, just wanted to highlight that as well as a success story. Next, we also have our friends at uh, Tapestry, which we'll be speaking afterwards, so stay tuned. They were beneficiaries of round two, getting started, finding ways to invest in the uh, social housing sector. I won't spend any time on that. We had the round three, which is Northern Access. This is about you know, um, having different technical ways of building in places that are remote or you know, hard to access certain times of the year, but also kind of the social processes behind this. So this is one I think is really interesting, is like looking at developing prototypes for development guides for mixed use buildings with customized combinations of one to five bedroom uh, housing units, commercial spaces, community spaces. And this was designed by the NISCA uh, communities to be used to design and think about how they can shape their communities in a really tangible way that works with you know, the builders to understand the bricks and mortars uh, needs of how these projects will come about. So it results in better planning um, and speed line, uh, streamlines the building process throughout the nation. This is a cool one that was on CBC News not too long ago, again, uh, based in BC. They're basically taking single family homes that are slated for development, putting them on wheels and selling them somewhere else so that you can build more density in a community so you're not throwing all that in a landfill, and you're maybe providing someone a home for below market. And they also, not only do they move the houses, but they also retrofit them so that they're higher in energy efficiency, and they can be you know, implemented in lower density neighborhoods, but just a really cool innovation that um, is thinking outside the box. And maybe that would be something that you could work with. Uh, say, hey, we'll sell you a home, just truck it away, give us some money for it, and we'll build a fourplex there or something there instead. Um, you know, just trying to think about ways that we can densify and provide affordability for our communities. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, I just have that slide up there. I always throw up. It's for updates. If you want to sign up to our newsletter, feel free to click away. Um, our programs do change, and so um, feel free to use that to keep up to date on the program changes or things that are upcoming, like that rental protection fund or the uh, public lands that should be coming forth soon, hopefully. Um, and um, I don't think I had my contact on there. And I, I didn't put it up because I want you to come talk to me. So if you want my contact information, you got to come say hi. Thank you so much, Jeremy.